I'm Bart, founder and CEO of Full Contact. Uh, Full Contact's mission, for those of you that don't know it, is to help people and businesses uh, be awesome with the people that matter most. We happen to make contact management apps and APIs that help people do this stuff. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about a little bit of how we actually operate at Full Contact, which is a leadership through vulnerability style. So to start off this, I'm going to actually challenge everybody in this room to do something for me. And this might be challenging given the audience, but I'd actually like you to pause. I'd like you to turn off your phone, close your laptop, and create a container here where we're actually all fully present and connected with each other. OK, thank you. So um, now, this is an interesting picture. This is my son, Grayson. Uh, I call him Gilo. Now, one picture is actually me, and one picture is my son, Grayson. Um, and he was born three years ago. Uh, he had a profound impact uh, on, on me as a person, as a human being, really understanding what it is I'm trying to do in this world. Right? And at Full Contact, we actually had a dramatic transformation as well three years ago that coincided with uh, the birth of Grayson. Um, I really struggled uh, when he was born. Uh, I, you know, I had a lot of angst and anger, resentment even. I had to deal with a lot of issues uh, surrounding my upbringing and my own relationship with my mother and my father, father and my lack of connection with my own family. And anybody who's been a parent knows that it can be an emotional roller coaster, right? Like having a child, raising a child. I even started a blog called Startup Baby comparing having a child to creating a startup. And the notion that literally every day your KPI is really simple. Zero or one. Is the kid alive or not? Is the startup alive or not? <laughs> right? And so that's a profound impact on me. So I'm just sharing with you a little bit about my past. I don't know most of you. I hope to get to know most of you eventually. But this is a little bit about my life and what has caused me to go on the journey that I'm on now. So um, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, so one thing that we do at Full Contact is something called a personal check-in. Okay? And it's a pretty simple construct. I literally start every meeting with a personal check-in with my leadership team or any meeting I conduct. It's really simple. It's actually honestly pausing and stopping and asking yourself the question, how am I doing really? How's my body? How's my breathing? How's my soul? Where am I at? Right? And you score it with red, yellow, green where green is sort of calm and peaceful, and yellow is a little bit anxious. You're not sure exactly what's going on, but there's a twinge of anxiety. You're not fully present. You're not really connected with the people around you. And then red is sort of this physically, you're in this anxious state. You're sort of, you know, we've all been there. Your mind's just swirling. You can't control it. Red, yellow, green. So let me just demonstrate for you. And Mike, could you come join me here? So Mike is my, uh, my VP of Sales and Services. And uh, Mike, we do this a lot yep. in full contact. So I'll go ahead and start, because it's important, as, actually, as a leader, that you model this behavior for your team. So uh, um, I'm actually in a yellow-ish state last night. Uh, probably had one too many whiskeys, which is inf inf you know, impacting me right now. Um, but you know, also, uh, you know, it's the end of the quarter. And you know, I love to win. And uh, you know, we've got a couple deals where we, we've got some swings, but I really want to hit that quarter. And so I'm, you know, I have a lot of uh, self-worth issues conflated with my business in terms of hitting that number. Um, so I'm somewhat anxious. I've also been away from my wife and kid for you know, a week uh, on the road. I'm kind of missing them. Um, and uh, in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, uh, we just had a big set of wildfires 
and uh, you know that that gave me pause. Like when you actually see your home about to burn down, it didn't it didn't happen, but it made me reflect on some things. Uh, yeah, so I'm a little yellow. Yeah. How are you? Thank you. Um, I, I'm also yellow. Uh, I, I I had um, one too many martinis last night. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, I missed last night talking to my kids before they went to bed. Mm. Um, missed them this morning because they were already at, at school. Uh, so anxious about that. Uh, before we came here, like I realized this conference is so valuable, um, which is why I came. And at the end of the quarter, I have a lot of anxiety that I'd rather be back at the home base as, as well, but uh, certainly trust my partners there. Um, so a little anxious, a little... Um, uh, but running towards green because I'm excited to be here. And all right. Yeah. Well, thank you. All yeah. right. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we do this all the time. We check in with each other as a leadership group, right, as a team. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is I want you to go find a complete stranger right now, and I want you to actually go check in with them for 90 seconds, so about 45 seconds each, all right? And go check in and be vulnerable with, with somebody you don't know. Go. Fifteen seconds, fifteen seconds. Okay. All right, let's start wrapping up. Five seconds, folks. Let's finish our check ins. Finish our check-ins. All right. Thank you. How'd that feel? Good. I heard it good. Anybody feel uncomfortable? It's okay. There's no judgment, by the way, when you actually check in. And that's an important construct. We simply just need to note actually how we're doing before we can actually connect with others. If you don't know what's going on here, you can't connect with other people. You can't lead, you can't manage. You have to know thyself first, right? And the reason we check in, um, <laughs> you know, I hate this. I hate this saying. For the last 40 years, maybe 50 years, since this movie was made, you know, it's not personal, it's just business. Bullshit. <laughs> What's more personal than something you pour 40, 50, 80 hours a week into? You spend time, significant time. I spend more time, sad to say, with my partner Mike here than I do my wife. That's not personal, right? The notion that we're just job titles is bullshit. Or we're just our KPIs is bullshit. We're people, right? 
as my good friend and mentor Brad Feld says, we're all just big bags of chemicals that come to work every day. <laughs> That's all we are, sloshing around. Those chemicals sometimes react in fundamentally different ways than you'd ever expect. So understanding what's going on when I show up for work, I show up as a leader, super important. You know, and as an entrepreneur, on a good day, on a good day, I can feel a range of emotions. I can feel challenged, energized, passionate, excited, hopeful, connected, right? You have those days where you're just, everything's in the flow and you're feeling great, right? On a bad day, I can feel a lot of things. I can feel lonely, burned out, anxious, fearful. I'll use the word suicidal. A lot of entrepreneurs feel that. They can get depressed. They can be scared. Now, <laughs> for an entrepreneur, though, <laughs> they're going to experience the range of emotions hour by hour, sometimes minute by minute. And it, the, the thing is, this, as your company grows and scales, you feel this more, more frequently. It doesn't get easier. You know, I like to tell people, look, the average person has a serious personal crisis uh, three times a year, right? So do the math. When you have 100 employees, how many people on your team are having a serious personal crisis? Do the math when you've got 50,000 customers, as Pipe Drive mentioned yesterday, of how many of them, their businesses are in crisis mode, right? Regulating yourself, understanding yourself, so you, you don't get crushed by this roller coaster of emotion, super important. Because rule number one of entrepreneurship, know thyself. If you know yourself and know what's going on here and actually how you're doing and what's going on and why you're responding in different ways to everything that's happening in your environment, you're ahead of 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet already. Because most people don't know what's going on actually here. They actually are just reacting to things, right? Because, you know, let's use a technology uh, sort of metaphor. What part of you is actually running the show? So the, the, the amazing stat is the, sort of the conscious mind operates at 2,000 bits per second. Think about that. Two kilobits per second is what it processes. The subconscious mind, 11 million bits per second. This is actually, you know, to, to explain it, it's actually separated out into the neocortex. So the neocortex, the rational or thinking brain, operates at two kilobits per second, right? The limbic brain, or where feelings and emotions come from, and the reptilian brain make up the remaining 11 million bits per second. I, call it, I like to call it the lizard brain, the instinctual brain, right? And as Seth Godin says, the idea of the lizard brain is this. It is hungry, it is scared, it is selfish, and it is horny. That's it. And that's all it does, right? The thing is, we are using our lizard brain all the time. We don't know it in business. You know why? Because what happens is the lizard brain's primary job is survival, OK? And this is an important concept. Because in a work environment, it may not sound like it's a primitive man state, but it actually is in many respects, right? Um, has anybody ever like, had a negative emotional reaction, just show of hands, no judgment, uh, to an email a coworker has sent that you felt slighted or threatened by? Mm -hmm. So why do you think you got triggered with anger in that moment? It's because your survival was at stake. You're sur you were actually threatened. Why? If you play it out, okay, coworker sends something that slights you or throws you under the bus, right? What's next? You lose your job, extreme case. Or you don't get promoted, you don't get paid. You're on the street, you're homeless, you can't survive. Your sense of self is threatened in that moment. So what's actually happening is there's a chain reaction occurring that's causing you, your survival instinct to be triggered. And some people fight in those moments, and some people flee in those moments, fight or flight, right? Here's the thing. 
knowing that that's going on, observing that before you react to something in anger or haste and saying, okay, stop. I'm feeling, or my emotional response is um, anger. Why? Okay, awesome. I understand. Understanding your own emotional state, super, super important, right? Now, the thing is, revealing vulnerability and actually naming it and saying, you know, I actually felt a little attacked there is not a weakness, right? We sort of have this mythical notion that uh, it's a weakness to actually say you're vulnerable with somebody at work or as a leader, you know what? I actually don't exactly know our strategic direction. I'm working on figuring it out and I'm afraid that I don't know exactly where it's at. Or I don't know if we're gonna actually hit our numbers this quarter. Choosing to be vulnerable is actually very courageous, okay? Let me demonstrate. Well, you didn't flinch. I'm not scary enough. Usually people flinch. <laughs> Shit. Uh, so now I'm feeling a little, yeah, I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling a little like, man, am I not even that scary that I, I come at you and you have zero fear that I'm gonna attack you? What is that my self-worth as a man? My goodness. Uh, well, my point is that, that, you know, if I was gonna stand, for example, like this, right? Like the boxer stance, physically. You, you actually have an emotional reaction to that, right? People feel fear because you're, you're protecting, but you're also ready to strike. People actually have a biological reaction to that, okay? And it's fight or flight, okay? Now here's the thing. If I do this, fully open, fully vulnerable, the physiological reaction is wildly different. It's actually, you, you would be a sociopath to attack me, okay? The biological reaction is usually to embrace and to help. We are hardwired to help people who are vulnerable, right? But if you're, if you're just halfway vulnerable, right, in a stance that's sort of half protected, half on the offensive, people are not gonna help you as much. As a leader, what do we need? We need people to help us achieve a common goal. And so vulnerability is not, is not something that hurts your mission as a leader. It helps your mission as a leader. If I'm open with my partners and open with my team about what's actually going on and what I'm afraid of, they can actually help me. So my good friend and mentor, uh, Jerry Colonna, uh, shared with me once upon a time a story I'm gonna to read to you. Um, and it's really about, it's called Eat Me If You Wish, okay? And it's about a Buddhist saint named Milarepa. And it's about addressing those things that you're scared of and you're afraid of and you're fearful of. So one day, Milarepa left his cave to gather firewood and when he returned, he found that his cave had been taken over by demons. There were demons everywhere. His first thought upon seeing them was, I have to get rid of them. He lunges toward them, chasing after them, trying forcefully to get them out of his cave. But the demons are completely unfazed. In fact, the more he chases the demons, the more comfortable and settled in they seem to be. Realizing that his efforts to run them out have failed miserably, Milarepa opts for a new approach and decides to teach them the Dharma. So if chasing them out won't work, then maybe hearing the teachings will change their minds and get them to go. So he takes his seat and begins. After a while, he looks around and realizes all the demons are still there. At this point, Milarepa lets out a deep breath of surrender knowing now that these demons will not be manipulated into leaving and that maybe he has something to learn from them. He looks deeply into the eyes of each demon and bows, saying, it looks like we're going to be here together for a while. I open myself to whatever you have to teach me. In that moment, all the demons but one disappear. 
one huge and especially fierce demon with flaring nostrils and dripping fangs is still there. So Mila Repa lets go even further. Stepping over to the largest demon, he offers himself completely, holding nothing back. Eat me if you wish. He places his head in the demon's mouth. And at that moment, the largest demon bows low and dissolves into space. Anybody in this room have demons they deal with? Fears, anxieties, troubles, worries? Maybe they're there to teach you something. What if you surrender to them? Right? You know, <clears throat> I'm, uh, every day I meditate and I use a visualization exercise. And what I meditate on is one of my biggest fears. And that is... Um, <coughs> I told you the story about my son and how I struggled with it when I was a new dad. And it goes back to uh, the idea that I'm not necessarily connected with uh, my family and what kind of loneliness that creates for me. And my biggest fear is actually not connecting well enough to other human beings. Ironic, I started a contact company, or is it? Why did this business model choose me? I want to help people connect with other people. Hmm. Interesting, right? But the thing is, what I meditate on is I try to embrace that reality every day. So I think about, wow, what happens if full contact fails? What happens if we've raised $50 million in capital and it doesn't work and it implodes? What happens if my investors lose all their money and never want to talk to me? I have an investor right here, right? What happens if people are whispering, there goes Bart. He lost $50 million of venture capital. He's an idiot. What happens when my son goes to school and they say, oh, there's Grayson. He's Bart's kid. His dad's an idiot. What happens when my wife goes to the grocery store? Says, oh, there's Sarah Lorraine. She's married to Bart. He's a fucking idiot. Well, that might happen already, but, <laughs> but uh, what happens if it becomes such a painful experience for her to be with me or my son to be around me that they don't want to be connected to me? And what happens if I lose them and she divorces me and I have no money left and I can't get a job because everybody here thinks I'm a fucking idiot? These are fears I actually meditate on every day before I go to work. What happens? What happens when I literally am broke, I'm penniless, I've had too much whiskey, and I'm out of a job, out of a home? What am I afraid of? And I meditate until I get to, I'm literally on the streets of Stockholm, homeless. Because I figure if you're going to be homeless, might as well be in Stockholm. But I embrace that and I get comfortable with it before I go to work every day. And I recognize the worst case scenario, I'm still me. My emotional responses, I can control. So I always ask yourself, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of as a leader? What are you really afraid of? All the difficult things in life you can face if you really understand what's going on here. So back to Young. Awareness and choice, right? Great quote. I'm not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. You have a choice as a leader of how you carry yourself into work, at home, into, quote, battle every day. And your emotional responses matter. Right. So the question is, what type of company do you want to build? And what type of leader do you want to become? At Full Contact, we've embraced the vulnerable leadership style. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love, I literally use the word love all the time with my partners at work. I love working with them. We sometimes joke we're more vulnerable with each other at work than we sometimes are at home. That's core to who we are. And it does work. So it's an I extend all of you an invitation. You can email me, Bart Lorang, bartatfullcontact.com. 
um, you know, and reach out. Uh, if anybody wants to share anything at all, I'm open to talk about this. I love connecting with people. I had told you I need it for my own validation and sense of self-worth. So please, do reach out. Thank you very much. Uh, so usually people say anticipation of fear uh, is actually more painful than the actual thing uh, at the worst case. But when you are uh, a founder and you are having so many pressures, uh, in, in the worst case scenario you are just yourself, but still you would be liable for many things. So how do you deal with that? You know, it, it's a reality. Yeah. It's, it's literally embracing them. Embracing the worst case is my experience of what works. So actually asking, okay, let's actually not just have anxiety at a surface level about those things, but let's actually talk about what will actually happen if that happens, right? And getting it out there and noting it and then actually understanding your emotional response and understanding what's below that. What's below that fear? Okay, what's below that fear? I'm say, oh, that's just a biological emotional response actually occurring in my chemicals ringing around. So intellectualizing it and becoming non-attached to those emotional responses, that's a tactic that I use that, that, that works. <laughs>